Welcome once again. In this video, Pastor Mensa Otabel talks about the one thing that can destroy our relationships, finances, and marriage. So what one thing is Pastor Mensa Otabel talking about? Let us find out together. Have you met a greedy person before? Somebody who wants more than is needed, more than is necessary, never satisfied, always, always, always looking for more and more and more and more. It's great to be hungry for things in life, but you make sure it's hunger and not greed. Because if, if greed drives you, you will destroy yourself. And uh, I have seen lots of great people with great potential who have just been greedy in their lives, greedy for so many things that have destroyed them. So you have to watch greed in your life. Let me start by defining what greed is. What is greed? Greed is a selfish and excessive desire for more of something than is needed. A selfish and excessive desire for more of something that is needed. It simply means that you don't need it, but you want to have it anyway. And you want to have it in excess, and it's all self-centered. You're not even desiring to share it with anybody or to bless people with it, but you just want to have it all for yourself. Greed is selfishness, it's excessiveness, and it is unnecessary because it's not something that you need. And it can be in relation to so many things. It can be in relation to money. It can relate to ambitions in life. It can relate to other desires we have in life. Sometimes they begin as good legitimate desires and then they get out of the hand and become something else and very, very destructive. So we're going to focus on greed today. There are two scriptures I want us to look at and then I will give you the examples from the scripture. Deuteronomy chapter 5 verse 21 and then we'll look at 1 John chapter 2 verses 16 and 17. Deuteronomy chapter 5 is part of the commandments of God, what we normally call the Ten Commandments. And uh, these are God's instructions for life, God's rules for living and for enjoying a good life. And this is what God says in Deuteronomy chapter 5 verse 21. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or husband, I may choose to add. And you shall not desire your neighbor's house, his field, his male servant, his female servant, his ox, his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. Well, these days we don't use ox and donkey, so his car, his motorbike, his aeroplane, his employees, his workers at home, the big business he has, the big company he's achieved, the big house he's built, don't covet them. It's good to want good things for yourself, but don't want them because somebody else has them. Because if you want things because somebody else has them, it is covetousness. And covetousness is rooted in greed, as we'll be finding out very soon. Then 1 John chapter 2 verse 16 and 17 we will find the three centers of greed in our lives for all that is in the world the lust of the flesh the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the father but is of the world and the world is passing away and the lust of it but he who does the will of god abides forever the lust of the flesh the lust of the eyes the pride of life you can underline them in your bible the lust of the flesh the lust of the eyes the pride of life every greed we have in life 
is centered in these three areas if you're going to be greedy excessive always wanting more never satisfied never content never happy never at peace with yourself the three areas you have to watch are these three areas and i'm going to talk about them today i'm going to do three case studies of greed how it affects some people or affected some people in the bible and i i think uh, you can relate to their stories and check yourself out whether you are greedy or not by the way do you, are you greedy so who is the who is greedy now if you are not who is he man somebody else all right now we'll find out whether you are greedy or not okay so we're going to do three case studies of greedy people and we're going to look at them in relation to the three centers that i've mentioned the first one is a gentleman in the book of joshua his name is achan achan and his problem of greed has to do with the lust of the eyes the lust of the eyes achan and the problem of eyes he had an eye problem it wasn't optical for him to go to an optician for spectacles but he had this problem that the things he sees talk to him you know there are people who who hear voices from what they see when they see a good shoe the good shoe says come to me come to me come to me <laughs> they hear voices from things and Achan was one of those people now if you remember the story when the children of Israel left Egypt through the Red Sea into the wilderness they were in the wilderness for quite a number of years about 40 years and then Moses died the leadership changed to Joshua in three days they crossed over from the one side to the other they crossed the Jordan the first city they had to fight was Jericho and you know the instruction God gave them was that they go around Jericho quietly silently for six days on the seventh day they'll go around quietly for six times and then on the seventh go they lift up a voice of triumph and the walls will come down they obeyed God and the, and the walls came down now God had instructed them and told them that since Jericho was the first city they were going to conquer everything that was in Jericho was dedicated to God the gold the silver the wealth the clothing everything was God's because it was the first fruit the first fruit always belongs to God and so nobody was supposed to personally take anything from Jericho and so they went in the walls came down they saw the booty and uh, Achan picked some of the things he was not supposed to pick but nobody knew he had picked the things until they went to the next battle to go and fight another city called A or I depending on how you're looking at it I meaning me A meaning what is this uh, <laughs> so well they went to fight I and uh, they lost to a small village and they lost so the people were perplexed having come up from a great victory from Jericho how could they lose in I so they inquired of the Lord and eventually God pointed out the one who had caused the trouble Achan so uh, Achan had to confess his sin so let's listen to his confession Joshua chapter 7 verse 19 to 21 now Joshua said to Achan my son I beg you give glory to the Lord God of Israel and make confession to him and tell me now what you have done and do not hide it from me so it means when you sin and confess your sin it, it gives glory to God and Achan answered Joshua and said indeed I've sinned against the Lord God of Israel and this is what I've done now he's going to tell us what he has done verse 21 when I saw 
Everybody say, I saw. All right, you can underline, I saw. When I saw among the spoils a beautiful Babylonian garment, 200 shekels of silver, and a wedge of gold, weighing 50 shekels, I coveted. Everybody say, I coveted. Underline, I coveted. I saw, I coveted. I coveted them and took them. Everybody say, took them. Underline, took them. Saw, coveted, take. And there they are, hidden. Everybody say, hidden. Underline, hidden. Hidden in the earth and in the midst of my tent with the silver under it. So, well, Achan, in confessing his sin, tells us how the greed works. How greed works. He, he's, he's shown us the steps by which greed manifests in our lives. But before those things happen, the first thing that Achan did wrong is that he disregarded the word of God. He disregarded God's will. Achan's problem started when he disregarded a direct instruction from God. God says, don't do it, and he did it. Anytime you disregard an instruction from God, you make yourself God. Because you overthrow him as your Lord and you make yourself your own Lord. You become your own master. So Achan disregarded the word of God or the, or, or the, the, the declaration of God or the will of God. And so he gives us the four things that happen. The first thing that we see happen in Achan's life, he says that I saw. What is that? That is seduction of what is seen. When what you see seduces you, what you see speaks to you, what you see begins to talk to you. Like going to, to the shop and seeing a nice bag, ladies. You don't have much money, but you see the bag and the bag is talking. All the gentlemen, you go to town and you see some nice shoes. And the shoes are talking. All the teenagers, you go out and you see a nice Nikes. And the Nike sneakers are talking. Come to me. Come to me. Buy me. I have to go home with you. We are going today. All right. Now, what Achan said was that, although God said don't touch anything, he saw a Babylonian garment. Now, I'm not sure how Babylonian garments were designed, but I suppose that they were gorgeous looking. And so he saw them, and although he had heard from God, when he saw those things, the things started talking to him. The clothes seduced him. He saw them. He was attracted to them. And he saw the gold, and he saw the silver, and all of a sudden, he forgot about the word of God. Greed starts with a seduction of the eyes what we see and all around us we see things we see wealth we see money we see houses we see cars we see people making living well and all of that and every time we see things the things speak to us they call to us they want us to get them the question is whose voice would you listen to the voice of jehovah or the voice of things the voice of clothes, the voice of cars, the voice of buildings, or the voice of God. Achan listened to the voice of the Babylonian garments. The seduction of what is seen. The second thing that Achan says went wrong, he says, I coveted. That is craving for riches. He developed extreme desires for the beautiful things that he saw. His whole body was driven to get those things. Have you ever gone out to the store? You see some item. It could be a shoe. It could be a handbag. It could be uh, furniture, a saucepan. And when you go home, it continues to speak to you. Has it ever happened to you before? You've left the shop, but you have a craving for it. You have a craving for it. 
and, and you talk to people about it and, and everything about you says go and get it that's what Achan says happened I, he had a craving for it it could be for money it could be for whatever but he started allowing the things he saw to drive him he says I coveted it I wanted it and in my mind I can imagine that Achan is in with the rest of Israel they are fighting and he enters a home and, and he sees the clothes and the, and the things are nice and the gold jewelry and everything is nice and he says no 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 I don't have to take it he runs out to join the people but something speaks to him go back go back go back go back go back go so he goes back he sees the thing I'm not gonna take it he goes and then he returns he goes back and forth but there is a coveting there is a craving because of what he saw greed starts with what you see and then what you crave for when you say that you crave for something it means that you can't live without it you can't live without it sometimes the devil makes us feel as if there are certain things we can't live without if you don't get that shoe you're going to die if you don't get that money your life is finished if you don't go and buy that handbag you are done if you don't change the tires of your car you are finished and sometimes the things that attract us are not necessary but they are excessive mostly because we are just coveting after them so he talks about the second thing that happened he says i coveted then he says he took that is grabbing for things the lust of the eyes grabs and once covetousness rules your life all you need to do is to devise the appropriate scheme to get the things you are coveting now for Achan to get those things he had to have a plan he couldn't just enter the house pick the things and walk out he had to have a plan in my mind I can imagine that he enters the house a couple of times he sees the clothes now he wants to get it so he's going to grab it but he must grab it without anybody seeing he's grabbing it so in my mind I can see Achan standing in front of the house where his goodies are and he tells the rest of the army oh the enemy is going over there and everybody moves away from the house and he looks around Joshua is not there everybody's departed from the house he picks everything in the house probably hides them in a bag makes all kinds of pretenses maybe he says I'm going to give it to the Lord he goes to the priest and goes behind the tent of the priest passes around gets to his own house and that's it because when you crave for something so much you have a plan for it sometimes the plan is dubious but you're going to follow it because your eyes have spoken to you your craving is speaking to you now you want to grab it at whatever cost he wants to grab it then the third thing the fourth thing that Achan talks about is he says I've hidden it I hid it hoarding of goods greedy people are normally hoarders they are not distributors they want it all for themselves it's self-centered it's selfish he can't share so he saw he coveted he grabbed and then he hoarded he hoarded everything that is the lust of the eyes do you know the number of things that people have coveted after you know sometimes it happens to all of us you see something and you feel until you buy it you'll never be free and then you buy it you use it for a while and you forget once in a while you open your wardrobe uh, or your closet and you see something that you bought you wore once or twice and that was it so what was it that drove you it wasn't necessity because you haven't worn those things for a while it was greed so who is greedy it was greed so why did you buy it 
it was unnecessary you wore it once and there it is and sometimes you go and look at the clothes that you have bought and you ask yourself why did i buy that why did i buy that but you bought it and the reason was because you are allowing the lust of the eyes to control you there are people who go to town and by the time they return they will definitely have bought something if you want to control greed one of the things you have to do is to learn to go to the shop go to the Accra mall pack your pocket with money or your wallet or your purse with money but don't buy anything it's self-control you everything is calling to you but you look around you look around you look around and return with your money that's one way to overcome self-control you know uh, when I was learning to control some of my appetites I, I remember uh, years ago I used to really fast for long periods you know my whole life was fasting I was fasting almost every time and uh, I would fast maybe a couple of days two three days and uh, when it was time to break my fast and believe you me when you fasted for about three days with no solid food you're hungry and so I get the food in front of me and the, your natural instinct is to dig into the food and 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 punish it for uh, for for denying you itself all right but I put the food down and sometimes I can put the food down, smell it, look at it for one hour. Just looking at it. I'm just telling the food I have power over you. You don't control me. You have to learn. Not, not learn to, to be able to see things and not just be grav gravitating towards it. Because if you don't learn that, your eyes will lead you your eyes will be your god that's the lust of the eyes and the world is full of the lust of the eyes that's why there is advertising see all these billboards what are they doing they are appealing to your eyes you see them you buy them i will never forget years ago when my wife and i we, we hadn't been married i mean would we'd be married probably five six years and I think we had two kids or so at the time, two or three, and uh, we're very fast. Uh, <laughs> and we saw this advertisement that was advertising a particular uh, product, a food product that you could spread on bread to eat. And the advertisement was so nice. And so the children were singing the advert. We were seeing it. And the way the guy munched the bread on TV, we went to buy the product. And we put it on bread. I couldn't finish eating one slice. Because it was a horrible, horrible product. But I saw it so much, I went to buy it. The last of the eyes advertisers know it that's why they show it to us because they know if you see it enough you will buy it that's why you have a lot of things you don't need but which you are greedy for and when you see other people having it you fight them to get it the lust of the eyes is a source of greed so who is greedy okay all right we're having a few candidates now the second greed area is in the area of the pride of life and the character we are studying is our old friend he's not really a friend he's our old enemies lucifer but at this time he was a he was a nice guy lucifer the pride of life and i'm going to show you how the pride of life works in greed things that will destroy us isaiah chapter 14 verses 12 to 15 isaiah 14 12 to 15 isaiah 14 12 to 15 it describes the devil before he became devil 
And he says, how are you falling from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? He started, right? How you are cut down to the ground. You who weaken the nations, for you have said in your heart, I will ascend. And the line, I will ascend. I will ascend in the, into heaven. I will exalt my throne. And the line, I will exalt my throne. Above the stars of God, I will also sit on the mount. And the line, I will also sit on the mount of the congregation. On the farther sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like, and the line, I will be like the most high. Then God says, yet you shall be brought down to shoal to the lowest depths of the pit. So what got the devil into trouble? He was the son of the morning. He had a great position. He was favored among all the angels. He had a pretty good position and a pretty good role in life. But he was never satisfied. There are people who are never satisfied no matter the position you put them in. No matter where you put them, they always are greedy for more. Let's examine how that worked in the life of Lucifer. The first is ambition. Ambition. He says, I will ascend. I will ascend. I will go up. The pride of life starts when naked and unrestrained ambition takes hold of our lives. I want to rise. And it's great to, 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 to have ambition. But ambition must be restrained. All of us have got ambition. I have ambition. You have ambition. But when it becomes unrestrained is when you have an ambition and you, you don't care what it takes for you to achieve it. You can use fair, foul, wicked, destructive means. You can betray your best friend, kill people around you, destroy people's reputation because you want to ascend. There are people who want to ascend and they don't care what it costs. They can betray their best friend. The people who want to get promotion in office, they don't care what it costs. They'll write letters about people, falsify information about people, set people up for failure. There are ladies who sleep with everybody to get to the top. I will ascend and they don't care what it takes. That is unrestrained ambition. Ambition that has no boundary, that has no self-control, that has no sense of proportion. It is greedy. I want to get it. I want to be great. I want to be big. I want to be powerful. I want to be famous. I want to be a millionaire. And I don't care what it costs. And don't come and advise me about what it costs. That kind of attitude is unrestrained ambition. It's what got Satan into trouble. And if you start with that attitude, pretty soon you will also become Satan. I know you want to ascend. But are there any things you will say, I want to ascend, but I will never do this. I want to ascend, I will never do that. I want to be great, but I will never compromise on that. If you have nothing that restrains you, and all you have is naked ambition, you are becoming satanic. You are on the path of Satan, and you will be destroyed, and it will destroy you ambition i will ascend ego then he moved beyond i will ascend he says i will exalt above that is competition i will exalt my throne above the stars of god not only does he want to ascend now he wants to be above the stars of god he he wants to bypass people the spirit of rivalry and competition kicks in. This happens when we become so obsessed with trying to beat everyone around us. We want to beat everybody. We want to be better than everybody. Even when we don't have the talent to do what we are doing, so far as somebody else is doing it, we want to beat them. So you don't want to sing, but you are forcing to sing. You don't know how to do accounts, 
but you're trying to be an accountant. You don't know, have the skills to be a salesman, but you're trying to sell simply because you want to beat somebody else. That is greed and it will destroy you. Satan is competitive. I will ascend. I will go beyond the stars of God. I want to be the best. It's good to have ambition in life, but you cannot be the best over somebody else. You can be the best of yourself, but not the best over somebody else. The best thing you can be is to be what God wants you to be. Use your skills, use your abilities, use your strengths, perfect yourself, improve yourself, but don't do that with somebody as your target. And sometimes we go through life, all we're doing in life is trying to compete against somebody else. I want to be better. I know a case of two friends who were pregnant. Ladies, obviously. And, uh, and there's a true story. One of them delivered earlier. And uh, about a month or so later, the second one delivered. When the second one delivered, the first question she asked the nurses is, is my baby bigger than my friends? Crazy. Your, your child has just been born. You are, you are using him for competition. And who said a bigger baby is a better baby? Who knows? Maybe his brain has scattered into all his body so he's fat but but this is this is what is my baby bigger and there are people who are like that is is, is his wife more beautiful than my wife what a crazy question what a crazy any man that asks that question needs to be lashed 12 24 times on the bare back how can you ask whether somebody's wife is more beautiful than your wife what is beauty anyway what is handsome anyway? I am the most handsome man suitable available on the planet. But that is as far as I can be. I am not more handsome than anybody else. I am the most handsome man suitable. But Pastor Autry is also the most handsome Pastor Autry. Pastor Osebonso is the most handsome Osebonso around. We are all the best that we can ever be, not the best against somebody else. How can you compare my nose with your nose? The structure is different. <laughs> Satan says, I will go beyond the stars of God. Who cares? Is that where you're supposed to be? Because sometimes you run a race that is not yours. You fight a battle that is not yours. Some people even pursue professions that is not theirs. And the, all they're doing is competing against somebody. Your best friend became an engineer. You want to beat him so you become a doctor. Now you are cutting people's intestines and killing them. <laughs> and you didn't want to be a doctor, but you just want to show, I can do better. And when you become so competitive, you can't even appreciate your life. Because life is not about competition. Because in this life, in, in a class, somebody is going to be first, somebody is going to be last. Whether you like it or not. Well, somebody's child will be first, somebody's child will be last. The people who are last, you think they don't have parents? You think they just came and said, we'll be last for everybody? No, they, they also have parents. But if you're a parent, you have to learn to appreciate the value of each child because I remember when I was in secondary school form 3 the third term exam my name was directly above the red line because in those days they, they, do a, they cut a red line and if your name is under the red line you repeat and my name just came directly. I think I was 29th or something like that. 
29. They cut up to 30. I was 29. Say thank you, Jesus. I survived. <laughs> I survived. <laughs> but who can say that because my name was on the borderline, I'll be a borderline person? This is just one phase of classroom. You don't even know how I was feeling. Maybe I had a fever at the exam. You don't know how I was feeling. You don't know how I was feeling. You know, so somebody looks at it and says, Ah, as for this guy, he always be borderline. Whoever said that your value is determined by 100% or 50% or the red ink of your teacher? Life is not about competing with people for grades. If you would just pursue your life, you would know that nobody can grade you for who you are and what you will become. You can become far greater than the expectation of people. But if you don't know that, you're going to spend all your life trying to be like somebody. I went to school with people who wanted to study pure science. And they, they couldn't do the mathematics. They were just like me. Couldn't do mathematics. Chemistry, crazy subject. Whoever invented that thing, wherever it came from. How can you do all this chemistry thing? And this guy couldn't do chemistry. He's a pure arts person. He's, he should do history. But he's doing pure science, physics, chemistry, biology, maths, pure maths. Even the diluted maths, you can't do it. You're doing pure one. But it's all competition. I will go beyond. I want to be higher than this. I want to be that. It's greedy, greedy, greedy. Self-destruction. That was Satan's problem. Make sure you don't become satanic. The third problem he had was covetousness. Covetousness. He said, I will also sit on the throne of God. Covetousness is when we want where, what the other person has. He has it, so I must have it. He's bought it, I must buy it. He just did it, I must do it. Do you know the number of people who are just doing something because somebody does it? Somebody is married, I must marry. He had a baby, I must also produce a baby. Somebody took their children on vacation to London so I must take my children to London whether it's killing me or not my children must go to London somebody had a big wedding and wore a nice veil I must wear a nice veil what kind of life is that it's greed it's greed it's excessive it's unnecessary you don't need it but you're going for it Satan says, I will also sit on the throne. Were you made for the throne? Is that where you're supposed to sit? Are you supposed to be that? I cannot do what you're doing. And you may not be able to do what I'm doing. You are called to do something different. Your skills are different. Your abilities are different. My skills are different. My abilities are different. My grace is different. My calling is different. I cannot say because somebody is doing something, I must do it. Can you imagine me? I'm, I'm saying that, oh, because uh, Ajna Sari is doing crusade. So I too, I want to do crusade. So I, I start announcing, men sort of build crusade. Bring the cripple. Bring the leper. Bring the deaf. Bring the dumb. And when they come, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? They, they have come. You say bring them. Ajna Sari said bring them. Old table say bring them. Bring them. So the lepers are there. Cripples are there. I'm looking at them. I say point number one. Point number two. That's not what they need. Somebody say well. But it means you are not powerful. Who say that? My power is in another department. We have power in different departments. We have abilities in different departments. We do different things. 
just because somebody does one thing does not mean it's better than yours. Yours is good. His is good. Both of you are powerful in different ways. The fourth problem with Satan was imitation. He says, I will be like the Most High. Imitation. Imitation is when you throw away your own uniqueness in order to be like somebody else. There are people who are imitating people every time. Ladies, especially sometimes, have mercy. One woman, they are dressing like Lady Diana. The next woman they are dressing like Michelle Obama. <laughs> next time they are dressing like Nadu Mills. <laughs> so when will you dress like you? When would you ever be yourself? Don't be fake. Don't let your life be an attempt to be like somebody else and never a settlement on who you are. I will be like. Who said? I can't be like anybody else. I am Mensa Otabel. You are who you are. That's what you are. Don't live your life trying hard to be like somebody else. There will be two of you and one of you is unnecessary. And guess who is unnecessary? The imitator is unnecessary. But when you understand you are here by purpose, by design, and by assignment, the world needs you. The world needs your uniqueness. Your, the world needs your special gifts. Don't try to be like somebody else. Definitely learn from people. Learn good values from people. Learn best practices from people. But a, Practice them in the context of your uniqueness because you cannot be like somebody else. You cannot be. You can only be yourself. And the best person you can be good at is yourself. Satan says, I will be like. The final area of greed we want to look at. And the case study is on a man, sadly, who should have known better. Solomon. The lust of the flesh. Greed got this man into trouble. Solomon is a study in contradiction. He's a paradox. A teacher of wisdom a practitioner of foolishness. He says the right things and does all the wrong things. Solomon is the one who taught us, be careful about the strange woman. Be careful about the adulterous woman. Be careful, young men. Be careful. They are certain tra he, he taught us all the things and then he did worse. Because sometimes we say the right things and do the wrong things. Even we preachers say the right things, do the wrong things. The Apostle Paul says, for this reason I subject myself, I put myself under subjection, lest after preaching to so many people, I myself become a castaway. Preachers are not masters of morality. We struggle with the same struggle like everybody. So when we preach, we are also preaching to ourselves. We have to be careful to practice the same things we preach. Unfortunately, Uncle Solomon didn't do that. Look at his story in 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 1 to 8. Very sad story, considering that this is a man who had a vision from God, God gave him wisdom. He built the most magnificent temple for Israel. Instituted the most fabulous worship procedure ever in the history of Israel. 
did all these great things. People were coming to him from all over the world to come from, to learn from him. But look at how he ended up. It says, but Solomon loved many foreign women. As well as the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites. From the nations of whom the Lord has said to the children of Israel, you shall not intermarry with them, nor they with you. Surely they will turn away your hearts after their gods. Solomon clung to these in love. Underline Solomon clung to these in love. You should have underlined earlier, love many foreign women. Clung to these in love. And he had 700 wives. I still can't wrap my mind around it. 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. For it was so when Solomon was old that his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not loyal to the Lord his God, as was the heart of his father David. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord, and did not follow the Lord as did his father David. Then Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, on the hill that is the east of Jerusalem, and for Molech, the abomination of the people of Ammon. And he did likewise for all his foreign wives who burned incense and sacrificed to their gods. Solomon was a pleasure lover. He was a very creative person, but he loved pleasure. He was very romantic, very poetic. He's the kind of person that the girls like. He reads poems to them and their hearts melt. He started by forming alliances with nations and as a way of forming alliance, he would marry from those nations to build political strength. He forgot that it was God who put him there and God would protect him and keep him. Soon he was deep in all kinds of destructive relationships with women. But his problem started first because he had ungoverned fleshly desires. The Bible says he loved many women. He had ungoverned fleshly desires. He couldn't rule his appetites. His flesh was not under his control. He knew the consequences of his actions. But he was a slave to pleasure. If it felt good, he would do it. There are people who are slaves to pleasure. They only do what feels good. Whether what feels good is bad or not, they do it. He had uncontrolled desires. Secondly, he built emotional soul ties with all these women. The Bible says he clung to them in love. In other words, not only was he physically intimate with them, but his emotions was bound to these people. He, he couldn't separate from them. He couldn't. In other words, if you met Solomon and you told Solomon, Hey, Solo, what are you doing? Thousand women? Tell him, do something about this thing. Or leave, leave, leave about hundred. I mean, this one, leave them. So Solomon will say, Hey, and what will I do? I would die. It had now become emotional. There are people who get themselves into soul ties. It starts, they say, oh yeah, I'm having fun. Oh, I can stop at any time. Now they can't stop. You know why you can't stop? It's a soul tie. You are in Solomon's path. Even the wisest man messed up. You think you have control over it? You don't have control over it. You need deliverance. Third thing that happened to Solomon is that his heart was turned after other gods. He declined into apostasy. He lost grip over his life. His value systems were going wrong. He couldn't control anything. Business is going bad. The kingdom is going to nuts. Everything is going wrong. He doesn't know how to 
get himself right and fix his problem because he has all these problems that are occupying his attention and he's not able to solve any problem. And let me tell you, especially men, those of you who get into positions of power and think you must use it to accumulate girlfriends, you will lose grip over your work and one of these days, you're going to end up disgracing yourself publicly. Because these women, you see what they did to Solomon? They made Solomon move away from God. Turn his heart. The girls will turn your heart. You'll be a thief very soon. Oh yeah. You have to service all of them. And girlfriends are more expensive than your wife. A wife is very stable. She has nowhere to take the money. Girlfriends have short term agenda. And they have to make the most within the shortest possible time they want the cars they want the houses they, and they will squeeze you they will squeeze you they will blackmail you they will, they will, they will do everything they will cry on you they will weary you they, they, they will make sure you do it that's what happened to Solomon the fourth thing is he became corrupt he went into abomination he started building temples temples for these gods temples for them temples is like men who buy cars and buy houses solomon's greatest achievement was to build the temple in jerusalem but after he built a temple in jerusalem he started building temples for all his wives and he built for their gods and these were very very filthy wicked dirty gods Molech was a god that required child sacrifice Ashtaroth was a god that required sex that's how they worshiped him and Je Solomon built a temple for that Solomon was sacrificing children Chemosh required incest that parents sleep with their children. And that's what he was gotten into. Here is a man who built for God. The glory of God came upon the house. God honored him. Now he's building all these little temples for these gods and worshiping with his wives. He doesn't even know what to believe again. He worships everywhere. And God appeared to him and said, Solomon, this is the end. After you, there will be no nation called Israel. Can you imagine one man? He says, after you, there will be no nation called Israel. I'm, I'm splitting the kingdom. And from that time, the kingdom was split. After him, there was all kinds of trouble. The nation went into captivity. It took all those years from the time of Solomon till 1948 for Israel to go back to their land because of this man. We found out that the one thing that can destroy anyone's life is greed. So let us do well to stay away from greed. Please like this video. Leave your thoughts in the comment section down below and also subscribe to our channel. Also, do not forget to visit Pastor Mesa Utabo's channel to watch more of his videos. Thank you.